Hello and good afternoon and welcome to our first webinar from our Office 365 series, How Much Could You Save by Going to Office 365? And so uh, we're going to start this webinar off. Uh, we intend to keep this very conversational and uh, we hope that you are planning on getting engaged in the discussion with us this afternoon. And we're going to um, start off with a quick poll. Uh, we'd just like to know a little bit more about you all and what your interests are and what you're hoping to achieve through this conversation. So uh, what I'd like to do is understand a little bit more about where you might be in the process. So for instance, uh, where, what brings you to our webinar today? Are you interested in um, Considering your options still, are you looking at Office 365? Are you already planning on rolling it out? I know we're asking quite a bit of you all. You've, you've just arrived and we just started and, and now you're, you're becoming the focus of the content. So we'll give it just a couple months, uh, a couple more minutes. And again, this is all mainly to just make sure that we can tailor the conversation to um, the varied interests of the folks who might be on the phone. Okay. Well, it seems as though most of you are still considering your options. And uh, a small percentage of you, about 20%, are within the next six months to uh, potentially rolling out Office 365. So we have kind of a broad range, and, and so my hope is that we can share some information with you about Office 365 to help you make your, de make your decision. So with me today, I also am joined my, by my partner in crime, Adam Levithan. Uh Adam, are you there? I am here. Adam, would you uh, give us a few words about yourself and what your interests are? Sure. Um, I am a senior consultant along with Jill at uh, Portal Solutions, and I focus on out-of-the-box solutions with SharePoint and building digital workplaces by integrating the tools that you already have at your fingertips. And Office 365 is near and dear to my heart because of um, how it is changing uh, the Microsoft world over the last year and a half and the great features that they keep adding to it. Uh, and we have a, on the slide that my most favorite TV show is Peppa Pig, and that's because I, I have three kids who grab the remote and hide it from me. Thanks for sharing, Adam. Uh, and so as um, Adam mentioned, I work with Adam at Portal Solutions. Uh, here I am a director of advisory services, working with a lot of customers in the design and discovery portions of their engagement. I also have a background in knowledge management and am very interested in the value proposition that Office 365 presents for creating the digital workplace which we'll talk about more in a few slides. And on a personal note, um, I, I have down here that my favorite vacation destination is Italy. Uh, I think the site, the food, the culture, it, it all just comes together to be perfect for me uh, when I want to get away. So we also have our Twitter handles up um, on the slide. And feel free to um, follow us, tweet us. If you follow us, we will follow you back. And um, again, the idea is just to keep the dialogue going. We're always open for uh, new ideas, suggestions, and or insights. So, uh, so feel free to um, connect. And quickly, just a couple notes about who we are. Uh, Portal Solutions, we are located and headquartered in Rockville, Maryland, in the Washington, D.C. metro area. We also have another office in uh, the Boston area as well. Uh, so our, our real, um, the real 
story in the path of our company, we've been in business for 12 years, and as such, we have completed over 250 plus SharePoint implementations. So we have been working with SharePoint since its 2003 iteration and have grown with the platform, and we've also been selected three times by Microsoft to be a part of their early adopter beta program. So uh, we have seen a lot with SharePoint, and with the um, coming of Office 365 and SharePoint Online, we've had a lot of um, exciting engagements figuring out new ways to leverage SharePoint technology. So what we're going to go over today is uh, we're going to review Office 365, its features, and this idea of the digital workplace. Then we're going to move into uh, reviewing some of the key areas for saving and moving that into a conversation about navigating licensing, what you should need, what you should be selecting for yourself, and how this could be potentially saving you thousands of dollars. And then finally, we're going to turn the tables again back on you all uh, and talk about getting started and understanding your needs in moving to Office 365. So I wanted to start off with this quote, uh, that Office 365 is, has delivered a 315% return on investment with a four-month payback period. So I think that this is a really interesting um, statistic, and it's, it's also one that you know, we have really tried to center this webinar around, um, because who, who would not want a 315% return on investment with an IT investment? I think it's, it's an incredibly powerful statistic, and really what we aim to do with this webinar is to try to disseminate some of the features and the components of Office 365 in order to help you align uh, the right capabilities with your business so that you can realize your own ROI of such high measures as well. And so talking a bit about the digital workplace, uh, you know, we're really centered around these four very current trends. Mobility, uh, the idea of being social, moving to the cloud, and disseminating and organizing and leveraging big data to our advantage. And really, the idea of the digital workplace to, to us is that it creates that environment where employees are able to quickly and easily share what they know and then find what they need. And I think the key here being in consistent experiences across devices and locations. And so this is really kind of the digital workplace utopia, if you will, that, that everyone is able to find what they they need and, and share what they know, as well as get it on, on their iPhone, get it on a tablet device, and share it across the enterprise. And so what you see on the right is Office 365, Yammer, Link, and SharePoint playing a key role in that entire digital workplace and what that means. So an, an, another question kind of most of our knowledge workers and most of our folks actually work within what we're calling systems of record on the left. Uh, CRM, HR systems, billing, uh, systems that contain customer information or transactional data. And so this is where they're spending the majority of their time. Uh, but how are they, how is that experience, how are they connecting, how are they collaborating? Uh, what is the con contextual relevancy of the information to some more unstructured ways that people are sharing information and interacting with one another? So the most common um, element in this scenario really is email, that email as a vehicle of communication is allowing folks within the enterprise and outside of the enterprise to um, collaborate with one another in an unstructured manner that usually revolves around some sort of data with our systems of record. And so really the idea is that if we can create that integration, create that contextual experience for our users with systems of engagement integrating with our systems of record, or not necessarily integrating, but just at least having the same contextual experience, we are going to be promoting knowledge transfer, knowledge retention, and uh, collaboration and teamwork 
and ultimately transparency across the enterprise and impacting the efficiency and the speed with which our users are able to get work completed. So then we turn our heads to the Office 365 suite. And here's kind of just a, a, a breakdown of the components that come within Office 365 as, as we currently, as we, most, as we know them the most commonly. So uh, Exchange Online, email, link online, instant messaging and voice, Office, um, Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint online, and then finally SharePoint online. And then all of this revolving around and being bundled together by the security parameters uh, that Microsoft Data Center is providing, 24-7 reliability and mobile access, mobile apps and the ability to access this information anywhere. So geographic divide becomes less of a concern. Jill, also a really interesting thing about um, the push by Microsoft to drive people to Office 365 is that part of the mobility is the purchase of apps or downloading of apps um, for your devices, whether it's Android or iOS um, or even Windows. And they're really great and they look really cool. And you would hope that if you had on-premise exchange and email and on-premise link, um, that all of these apps would work. And it's not so. Um, they require your Office 365 account. So really, it's just the, the cherry on top of all of Microsoft's marketing that they're driving business by, by access to these apps uh, on those alternative devices. Thanks, Adam. That's a really important point. And I think the focus on mobility and the use on mobile devices is one of the strongest priorities for 2014 for a lot of organizations that I've been talking to. So um, we do like to highlight SharePoint since that is um, a, a product near and dear to our hearts. <laughs> But really, what does this mean? Um, what is Office 365 providing you? And, and we put this in terms of, of capability and what are you getting out of the Office 365 platform. So you know, one of the reasons why I, I know a lot of folks are looking at Office 365 is for any one of these reasons or a combination of the reasons that you see on this slide. So reduced IT maintenance is is probably one of the strongest reasons uh, to, to consider Office 365 and moving to the cloud. But then you have a few other elements such as mobile or um, search, file sharing that, and availability that are also really strong business cases and business reasons to be considering Office 365. Um, and each of these in its own way is contributing to uh, an ROI that could either be measured, um, a hard ROI that can be measured, or more of a soft ROI that is a less easy, easy to quantify. So a lot of questions come up, and you know, this is there are a lot of risks associated with potentially moving to the cloud. Uh, and so one of the questions is, is my data secure in the, in the cloud? And you know, this is really um, just mainly an, an excerpt of uh, the, data, the data encryption and data security policies that the Microsoft Data Center follows. Um, but again, it, it, it's up to date with many, um, many of the most current trends and or compliance regulations surrounding security that you would want to um, be considerate of. And as such, uh, we are seeing more government agencies starting to consider a potential move to the cloud because of the data center security that Office 365 offers. Actually, Jill, um, um, one, of the, one of the customers we were uh, just working with is, is looking to move off of Google Docs, and one of the reasons was they started using it about two years ago, and that was before this Office 365 launch for Microsoft, and certainly before they had a um, federally approved cloud. So all of this is moving very rapidly that they 
um, have put up those um, clouds. As you said, they're expanding on encryption and all the regulations that they need to. And uh, just one mention of this uptime, that uptime is a huge um, focus for them, and they're putting up redundant farms. And when you talk about a server farm for Microsoft, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of units in, in a single building, um, very similar to the NSA <laughs> servers that uh, uh, Mr. Snow down the right there um, showed uh, are storing interesting data. I know, it's kind of a bad joke, really. <laughs> so a few other risks in moving to the cloud, and, and Adam's already touched on a few of these, but you know, these are, these are some primary thoughts and concerns that, that you would consider in, in moving there. So sensitive data for your company may end up residing outside of the organization. Uh, and so this is really going to be a threat irregardless of whether you decide to go with Office 365 or if, we, or if you partner with a, uh, another hosting provider uh, to set up your own private cloud instance. Uh, and, and the reality of this is that um, evaluating your SLA with that organization, evaluating security parameters that they have and what um, encryption methods they have and how they support um, the ownership of data uh, that lives in, in the cloud hosted provided uh, facility. And so, it, you know, it is a valid concern. Uh, and then second being giving up control and upgrade uh, rollout schedules. And uh, I actually sort of, I, I, I like to think of this actually as, as potentially a benefit as well um, in the sense that you are also looking at uh, being able to provide your folks with the latest and greatest. But I think that this is um, mainly a communication issue and a con an issue that can be resolved with communication with your hosting provider and making sure that you understand when rollouts are going to occur and having some level of control as to when you introduce those and the communication and education you provide your users with any major changes that may occur in the upgrade or rollout. Uh, another, um, the Microsoft service going down and your own internet service going down. Uh, you know, with, with Microsoft, it is possible that there is a 0.01% chance that the Microsoft Data Center could go down. However, I think the likelihood of that happening um, versus potentially the likelihood of your on-premise environment going down or search breaking or, or something along those lines is perhaps a little greater. Uh, we've, we've known a lot of SharePoint instances that weren't being properly managed and had continual downtime over the course of its life, life cycle. And so then you're looking at potential farm enhancements uh, to ensure that um, you're providing a, a stable and reliable data, data source for your users. And then with your own internet service going down, uh, Office 365 does also provide a lot of offline syncing capabilities that allow your folks to still work offline. And it's, it's also another enhancement for um, any of your users who travel to um, countries where bandwidth may not be at the same level as it is here in the United States. And so these are a lot of um, opportunities to still leverage the cloud hosted provided uh, anywhere in the world. and still maintain productivity uh, by working offline and, and thinking when you can get a reliable connection. Adam, any, any other thoughts around these risks? Well, I just think, you know, um, especially for the upgrade one, I think the major difference for that is with it in the SharePoint online. Um, nobody likes uh, upgrading Exchange themselves. and you know, as with most Microsoft products, we're already not using a lot of the functionality here, so that those are a real major benefit. Yet, um, you might have to, for Link, upgrade the, uh, the Link client that is on your computer um, once in a while as they do upgrades. But there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that are really great. It's only with um, SharePoint that that becomes a major option. and 
you know, if people have done a little research on that, they might have come across the new, the quote unquote new app model. And that new app model is actually even to, to help with um, upgrading because the custom applications that you're doing are actually not on your SharePoint farm anymore so that you have control of that upgrade and of the customizations that we used to do um, on the server itself. All right, Adam, we actually have a, a question that came in uh, while I was having some technical issues. And the question is, is how does Office 365 relate to big data? Would you like to take that one or take a stab? Well, that, that's a really interesting question. So uh, I can say it in the fun way, which is if you have big data, you can store it within um, SharePoint Online or your OneDrive, and you can let Microsoft deal with it. <laughs> uh, but really, uh, big data processing is not necessarily in SharePoint Online. Uh, Microsoft would like you to have that within their Azure uh, on-cloud uh, server farm, where you could have uh, SQL databases that are um, recording all of your data um, in, in the cloud. So it's, uh, right now, who knows if it'll merge, it is actually a different um, service that Microsoft provides to be able to do cloud uh, data storage. Well, and there's also um, Power BI, Power Business Intelligence, that uh, has just um, come out of beta, and it is a um, analyzing tool that allows you to point uh, Power BI against any data repository, whether it be public on the web or uh, you can point it toward uh, one of your own internal resources. But essentially, it, the data needs to um, be web-enabled for it to be um, indexed. And, and it's really like a, um, an Excel workbook on steroids. And it allows you to slice and dice the data and then um, create different dashboards and charts that can be displayed on a SharePoint site. So uh, we're going to take you through really quickly on, on where, where you can find some hard ROI in leveraging Office 365. Uh, one of the pieces is with eliminating hardware um, by actually offloading the infrastructure um, to the cloud you no longer have to maintain and or support a data center um, within your own premises and also uh, the, the hardware and the labor associated with managing that data center. And um, with web conferencing, uh, Link Online uh, provides you with and or Link On Premises can provide you with web conferencing technology, video conferencing, IM, and presence that is really a critical piece to um, the digital workplace and allowing you to, um, allowing your workers to work remote, work from different offices, and to still have that same type of interpersonal feel in being able to meet with one another, whiteboard together on the screen, and share information and content through screen sharing. Uh, and so um, this basically can replace a WebEx or a GoToMeeting uh, that you may have a subscription for that can be very costly on a, on a per meeting basis, but allowing you to leverage the online service and having it bundled in with your Office 365 account. I have to say that it's quite ironic that you're saying that uh, after you've had a, an issue with your GoToMeeting. <laughs> it, it is kind of ironic. <laughs> Uh, and then another uh, benefit of going to Office 365 is avoided on-premises implementation and administration labor. Uh, so SharePoint administration alone um, can become a very costly um, endeavor and uh, allocating resources to, to this and a resource with skill sets that can probably be used in other areas across the organization. Um, and for anyone who is currently on SharePoint and you are on, on SharePoint 2010, then you probably understand uh, the on-premises implementation uh, cost associated with standing SharePoint up and a SharePoint implementation. And, uh, and on top of that, uh, it depends on how close you are to your 
Information Technology Group, but you might have heard of something called Patch Tuesday. And Patch Tuesday is a uh, monthly release from Microsoft for all of its services. So beyond SharePoint, Exchange, Link, even your browsers and operating systems always have patches that are coming out every single month. And so you have staff that are dedicated to testing those out, to uh, applying them to probably two separate environments, and then deploying them to your production environment late in the evening or on the weekend. So uh, they will appreciate this. I do want to make a comment, too. We're not saying that you're going to eliminate all administrators, uh, because you do need someone to still care um, for your Office 365, but it's a much different skill set than is what require, is required for managing all of these on-premise systems. The latest functionality and ease of upgrading technology. Uh, and because of the cadence with which cloud, um, the, the cloud will release, uh, Microsoft will be releasing new updates on, on the within Office 365, uh, you're going to receive updates to the technology a lot more quickly than in um, what is traditional um, software patch release cycles. Uh, and I believe that it's, it's supposed to be at least um, every month, perhaps every 30 days, I think. Well, I think that, that yeah, that patches and then major features are about 90 days now. Okay. And so this provides your users with a way to be leveraging the latest version of Office, the latest version of SharePoint, the latest version of Exchange and Link, and those capabilities and how they all work together. Uh, you can also save on your enterprise agreement licenses by substituting with Office 365 subscription. And so we'll get to this in a little bit, a little bit more, where we do have a comparison against um, the enterprise agreement software licenses for SharePoint on-premise versus Office 365 subscription. Improved archiving and compliance, and also improved availability and disaster recovery. Uh, and, and so these are probably two of the very different vein, um, but you can, you can take a look at how inexpensive storage cost is with SharePoint or with Office 365 in being able to archive the information as well as the e-discovery piece that uh, comes with the E3 and E4 licensing packages for Office 365 that can provide you additional layer of compliance and retaining information across your, um, across your entire environment. Um, and then likewise, with improved availability, the 99.98% uptime and disaster recovery SLA that you get from Office 365, um, you couple these services in with perhaps the a la carte or the additional um, costs and services that these would require if you were to um, go with, if you were to manage these yourself and be looking for separate providers for availability and, and as well as disaster recovery. And I do know that a number of customers of ours have, um, have gone to Office 365 for, for two, both of these very reasons. And then finally, um, improving your knowledge worker efficiency. Uh, with all of the previous benefits, we, we haven't assigned any dollar values to those, but those in, in every instance, uh, you could assess what your current costs are for each of those different elements, and then compare it against what it would cost for a total cost of ownership to leverage Office 365. And uh, these can be hard, um, hard numbers that you can measure um, to assess your ROI and to start attaining whether or not uh, you, what, or to assess what, what your return on investment would be. Um, improving knowledge worker efficiency, this one is a little bit more difficult to measure. And uh, it, can, it can definitely stem through a couple user studies um, conducting um, what challenges, what pain points your users have, the recreation of knowledge, the recreation of documents, um, reinventing of, of wheels that were created time and time again, 
and um, measure those productivity increases in the minutes and the time saved that a user could have. So jumping into licensing for a minute, and um, actually we do have a couple of questions. Um, so um, one is, how many people can share cameras with a link at once? And um, Adam, I think you probably know this answer, answer offhand. It was uh, share what together? Cameras with link at one time. Oh, um, I think they get really, really small. I think it's up to 10. OK, and then we also have another question. Uh, does Office 365 provide for legal holds on selected data as part of archiving and compliance? And the answer to that one is yes. Uh, with SharePoint Online, uh, there are records retention uh, capabilities that allow you to um, schedule holds. Um, likewise, with um, Exchange and the eDiscovery, uh, it's, it's primarily a keyword or content type based um, driven methodology, but uh, you, can essentially, you can essentially write rules to have certain types of documents or documents with certain uh, data within its contents to be held, for, on, held on legal hold and uh, applied um, and a retention schedule can be applied to those documents. Yeah, and I think just to add a comment onto that, because it's a great question, is eDiscovery e is a really powerful tool, and it's, of course, available on-premise, but the likelihood that you have all of the latest versions of the Microsoft product is not really a realistic one. Uh, so it's, it makes it even more amazing that it, as soon as you go into Office 365 and you have Exchange Link and SharePoint all hosted in one place, you can do that e-discovery. So jumping into the basics of licensing uh, Office 365 plans, uh, you know, the most common plans are the e-plans and the k-plans, the enterprise and kiosk worker plans. Uh, what you see in the middle here, small business, 25 users max, mid-sized business, 30, 300 users max, those do exist for um, for smaller organizations, people looking to gain some productivity and get the suite of products. Uh, I think especially for a small business, Office 365 is, is a plan that cannot be beat as far as providing you with email, storage, file sharing, website, um, intranet, and uh, IM and presence management. I think it's, it's just a, a great deal. Um, but for the most part, where, where most of us lie, um, we're going to be focusing primarily on the enterprise and the kiosk deskless workers. And so this is really um, between these two levels of, of plans, this is where you're going to be able to do some manipulation and be able to potentially realize savings with your licensing costs. Um, so the mid-sized business with the 300 users max, uh, a number of companies fit within that fold, um, Portal Solutions included. However, uh, for you know, the difference in licensing costs that it presents, the mid-sized business is about $15 per user per month. Uh, the enterprise E3 at $20 presents quite a, a more robust feature set and can provide a greater level of savings for around the same amount of users. And so uh, we'll take a look at those plans in just a second. But uh, the idea really here is that the kiosk deathless workers plan is one that can be mixed and matched with the enterprise level plans. And so that's really the assessment here. Um, and a lot of folks um, assume that their users require all of the components that come with one of the enterprise level plans. But perhaps um, based on their job responsibilities, based on the type of work they complete every day, a kiosk level uh, plan for a majority of users might be exactly what they need. And so we'll take a look quickly at the different enterprise level um, pricing 
for Office 365. And again, um, this is really for um, the enterprise level. There are other plans for education and charity, nonprofit pricing. Uh, and so those are at a much different level and, and one that you might want to negotiate with your Microsoft rep. But um, just looking at a straight feature comparison for the most part, uh, you know, taking a look at Exchange online only, $4 per user per month. So assessing that you just want to move Exchange to the cloud, you would like email to be up there, you get 50 gigabytes per user in storage capabilities, and that's all you want. But as we start looking between E1 and E3, uh, there is a significant price difference with $8 per month um, per user per month versus $20 per user per month. And what we're finding is that a lot of organizations, uh, we do recommend that you go to the $20 per user per month, and mainly because you're going to get that office applications, um, the, that app office applications level for the desktop. And giving your folks the latest in office products um, to use on their desktop, and that's already bundled in, and you don't have to accommodate that for um, another another area of your enterprise licensing with with Microsoft. Uh, the main difference with E4 is that you acquire the enterprise voice, and that's uh, the equivalent of of Link on premises, where you can integrate your phone voice over IP system with Link uh, to provide an integrated voice and web conferencing experience. And Adam, did you, um, I think you, you have a, a little experience or with, some of, with some of these different plans and, and working with some of your customers? Yeah, definitely. And, and um, you know, the interesting thing is you can see, too, that there is no E2. <laughs> um, and uh, there used to be. So these um, plans are changing as the uh, Microsoft offerings are evolving and the interesting thing is um, Jill had just said about E4 is that the integration directly with the phone service um, provided by Microsoft wasn't available just a few months ago and they reintegrated that and put it back into their stack. Um, also you know to highlight that the um, very small services, the T level uh, are on completely different servers than um, the E, so that if you ever wanted to migrate, it actually um, would be uh, a big process. Uh, so if you know that your company is growing quickly and that it might you know, go over those counts, then uh, again, starting with an enterprise license uh, might be good. At, um, so an interesting thing with the, the corporation that I've talked about before, that merged, you know, the five separate active directories, not everybody is actually paying. It's not a key system, but within the uh, E3 level, within that, they are not uh, paying for everyone to have access to everything. So um, 